I know most of you guys, but it might be a good opportunity just when you ask a question to you know, identify yourself for someone you don't know. Cool. Um, shoot, let's have, let's have at it. Uh, I don't have any opening statements. I'm Sean Patton. I'm the general manager and uh, thrilled to be here. Hey, Sean. It's Steve Martin with Rivals. Um, what are your responsibilities as general manager here? Sure. Uh, so all of the recruiting apparatus essentially runs up to me. So Vince Ginta, who's our senior director of player personnel, um, reports to me. Keith Williams, who's our director of player personnel, also reports to me. And so all things associated with recruiting essentially runs up to me. Uh, additionally to that, I am the main liaison to our collective, to the 1890 initiative. And so I work with them on a daily basis. Uh, they keep me up to speed on everything that's happening on their end, any sort of updates, any sort of new contracts, any sort of, you know, they have to, you know, disclose everything to us. So I'm very heavily involved in that day to day. Uh, and then I have a couple of side jobs uh, that I do here. Uh, one of which is, is uh, you know, I, I run the Spring League uh, when we're here and just really that's more about game preparation than it is about all of the, the quote-unquote pageantry that we like to throw to it. Um, but it's really about game preparation. So in season I work with Coach on, um, you know, the decision-making that's happening in game. You know, I sort of hand him the book, frankly, and point at things. Um, but, uh, you know, I also help a lot with our scout teams. So I'm, I'm hoping that in June they allow to take the uh, gloves off and let additional coaches be able to help out and coach. Um, but really I help our young coaches get the young players prepared uh, on the scout team. So I run what we call the scout team Raiders, uh, the Lancaster County Raiders, as I like to call them. Uh, and, and it's really just a fun way to stay on top of the young guys. Really, I grade every one of their days so that I get a sense of how they're developing, how they're coming along, and it also allows me to engage the younger players on the team with regard to their development. Sometimes guys end up on scout team and uh, feel like they're you know, lost somewhere. Well, I, I lived on scout team for three seasons of college football, and so I know what it's like. And so I want to make sure that we can give the best possible look. So if we're the most well prepared for those days uh, and throw some enthusiasm behind it. So that's kind of my fun stuff uh, in the fall. Um, that's pretty much it. And then whatever duties as assigned. Do you have a sense on the coaching change rule, like when that's going to get discussed and voted on? I believe that the subcommittee is looking at it this in the next week or so and then I think that has to get the oversight committee and then I believe that has to then get approved uh, sometime in June. How do you like do you see a lot of teams beefing up more hires or just kind of promoting people on the field that have been behind the scenes? Uh, I haven't really done an analysis to really sort of take a look and see. I know that the um, consultant uh, person, the analyst sort of that comes in, I know for years now folks have gotten bigger ticket type folks to, to kind of be there or coaches that are in between type of opportunities. So I think that bulk up, so to speak, has been happening. Um, I don't know if necessarily it was driven by a move to the field or not. I can't speak to other people, but I think that folks have been, you know, filling their rooms with good coaches uh, for a few years now as best they can. What's your, what's your sense, Sean, of, of what kind of benefit it could be for Nebraska if if that occurs, I mean, you know the these young coaches, the GAs, and the interns and analysts on on the staff better than any of us. So, what do you what do you feel like that group of coaches would have to add if, if this if this comes to fruition? I, I think that we're because we're a developmental staff, because it's very important that everybody has the ability to teach, <clears throat> that everybody has the ability to, to to reach young people, and because hopefully, knock on wood, we continue to do so. I'm sure this will lead into other questions, but you know we're not a, we're not a team that's hoping to have a ton of turnover. We're hoping to have continuity, and we're hoping to have a cohort carry its way through and accomplish something uh, you know, at the end of their time. And so when you have the ability to have more young coaches 
being hands-on, on the field, more developmental, being able to take corrections. Like, for example, I mentioned the scout team earlier. We don't follow cards on scout team, more or less. We try and put, you know, if we're preparing for, say, Michigan, we try and put Michigan's offense into our terminology so that our offensive players are con continuing to develop under our system, not just looking at cards. It doesn't make them better. They're making the same calls that that they would be making if they were Nebraska offensive linemen as they combo here or combo there or work back to that individual. So we, we try and put everything into Nebraska language so that they're continuing to develop even as their young guys given a look about something else or about someone else. We still try and put all of that into our terminology and a lot of times we will have coaches cross the side. So we'll have an offensive coach come and work with the scout team offense so that he can help translate. If Tony needs a look real quick, he can say, oh, no, no, that's trips right, you know, Mongo or whatever the heck, you know, call you want to have. But that's when you have young coaches that and you have a, a program that's really designed to have that further development, the more those, those, those young people can be hands-on uh, and can do instruction on the field, I think it makes, I think it fits the way we're set up pretty well. Sean, what were the biggest challenges of the NIL piece when you came back, when you came to Nebraska after being at Carolina and college football's obviously been shifting a lot while you were in the NFL? What, what, what were the biggest uh, things in front of you? Well, I always, I'm, I'm, a, I'm gonna geek out here a little bit, but I'm a fan of chaos theory, so I, I try and Try and take a look and understand. And you got to know your starting point. You got to know your end point. And you got to know the conditions that are in there. So the most difficult part is, is that the conditions kept changing. The conditions were moving under your feet as things were going. And so that was probably the most difficult part. Now, prior to that, I was at Carolina. And I was, uh, fortunately, uh, the COVID coordinator for the team. So things moving under your feet, uh, you know, how about a 47-page memo coming out of Park Avenue, brand new, with uh, no time to implement. Uh, so that's just the way things go. And so, but the most difficult challenge is, is that the conditions themselves seem to keep changing, whether it's um, portal uh with regard to transfers, uh, it, it's the conditions keep changing. And so that's the challenge. Uh, but I'm excited about it. That's why I'm here. Hey, Sean. I'm Lauren Michaels from KTV in Omaha. What is it about Matt Rule that's kept you wanting to work alongside him through these stops? I think that early on we discovered uh, a similar philosophy. Early on when we were together, we were 23 years old. We both had our first jobs out of football. <laughs> He was coming from Penn State. I was coming from Catholic University. So two very different, very different types of places. But we had a, a, a very similar approach to it all. Um, very much uh, teaching oriented. Very much um, say what you mean. Say exactly what you mean when you're when you're talking. And and in that in that first defensive uh, staff room I ever worked in, it was myself, him. Our defense coordinator was Jeff Collins, who's now the DC at, at North Carolina. And then we had two student assistants, Jason Eberts and, um, and Sean Hill and, and, and uh, uh, Eddie, and, but uh, Eddie Baker. But we, we fought. I mean, we fought. We went after each other there as we were talking about different things. I still remember one of the first arguments that he and I had. We felt passionately about it, but when it was done and the coordinator decided, okay, we're going to do this, then we just, we just moved on. We kind of both got it. We both understood it. Uh, and we both understood that you could do a little bit more, both him coming from a walk-on background and me coming from, well, there's nothing but walk-ons in D3. But I, I think we came from a, you can always do more, you can always work harder. Uh, we sort of came from that background. And then professionally, we sort of understood early on that we could speak as passionately as we want to in the office and not lose respect for each other or not carry it uh, beyond that. I mean, he and I lived in a dorm uh, essentially an abandoned dorm. Uh, he and I were the only two rooms on the floor. Um, so, you know, we had no choice but to get over it when we walked back home. But I think professionally we, we, we understood each other pretty early on. And then, you know, what it took from a teaching standpoint and from a demand of a player standpoint, I think that's what sort of brought us together. And, and you have to, when you work as hard as people work in this industry, you have to share the same values. Uh, you don't want to be in a program that doesn't share the same values. So. Hey, Sean. Aaron Rodgers, Jeff Fisher, 
and Sorensen with Counter Aid. I'm curious when you're talking about chaos theory, which I love, but more specifically with your role, we've heard what Coach Rule has talked about with roster management. With your bridging that gap with 1890 and the ever-changing world of NIL transfers, everything, how, how are you approaching roster management and how are you working with him to kind of work through this as chaos theory continues to change it? Well, it's again, it's it's the conditions, right? So the conditions are changing. One day you read an article and they're saying you, you're, you might be capped at, at 120 or you might be capped at 85. Um, so all of that is, is very difficult to manage. The most important thing about the whole process is being open and honest with the players, with the athletes. Coach has a... Um, you know, we're, we're all in meetings as soon as the semester ends. Position coaches are in meetings with players, telling players exactly where they feel they, they sit in terms, of <clears throat> in terms of how they most recently acted and in terms of um, where they feel and project they're going to perform in the fall. Um, then, coach, then all those players sit down with the head coach, and the head coach has open, honest conversations based on where he th sees them in the fall you know, where they can be. And, and he tells them, prove me wrong. I might be wrong. Prove me wrong. But I think if you have open, honest conversations with guys about where it might stand, depending on where they draw the line, uh, then I think that that's the best you can do. Uh, if, and especially being that they have options. They have options. So you want to be as open and honest with them so that they can explore their options if it's a circumstance whereby they come out of there not feeling like you know, this is where they need to be, you have to have those open and honest conversations. And after they have those conversations, then they'll come and have conversations with me um, about their approach with their next contract. I'm allowed to sort of talk to them about it and, and you know, they can go and, and sort of request uh, if, they, if they, you know, what they sign next, but ultimately the numbers come from them. Um, so as far as the roster management piece, we just try and be honest. Just try and say, hey, if this were to, you know, if, if this were to come down at this point right now, this is where you would stand. And that's the best you can do. Since so much of that, um, the NIL uh, landscape and, and things that deal with roster management are controlled by entities outside of here. You know, you have to, you have to play by the rules as they exist, and they're always changing, seemingly. What do you do to kind of keep yourself in touch with where things are at nationally so you know which way the, the wind is blowing? And, and what kind of a sense do you get on where NIL is headed over the you know, next, year, next year or two? Are they going to stay well, with collectives? Is it going to come in-house? My, my prediction? Uh, well, first of all, to answer the first party question, I, I follow everybody here in terms of that's how I stay informed. Um, but also, no, I mean, D1 ticker, I'm on that all the time, NIL. Uh, I get a bunch of different emails every single day and follow different people, and whether it's Matt Brown or Ross Dellinger or, or whomever, you know, I, I try and follow that because sometimes they're, sometimes they're being leaked something, and sometimes they're putting something out to see what that response is. So everything that you see is taken with a grain of salt. Um, but that's the best you can do is to sort of just try. And, and I listen, years ago, I knew this was coming. Years ago, I, I grabbed Mac Rhodes aside and I'm like, hey, I'm seeing this case work its way through. He goes, yeah, yeah. He goes, yeah, it's going to go all the way through. He goes, just be ready. And I remember the first thing I said to him was, are the conferences aligned? Because that was my biggest concern at the time. I said, are the conferences aligned or are we going to people go splitzo on this, whether it's O'Bannon or whether it was Alston? Um, so this has been something that's been on my brain for a long time and more at the time being an operations guy it was more because I kept thinking to myself who's going to advise these guys there's going to be an office there's going to be a line outside of my door of, of guys getting screwed over on deals like how's that going to work I mean that first Miami deal was not good I mean, that licensing in perpetuity no one should be signing their licensing over in perpetuity um, but Who's going to advise that? I'm glad that the governor and this state legislature passed a new law that allows us to kind of be more hands-on, to, to sort of help us advise and facilitate and, and be more involved in it as opposed to just, hey, best of luck to you. Hey, Sean. Uh, Luke Mullen from the Lincoln Journal Star. Um, in this era of NIL, have you found it, it maybe gives you more flexibility in dealing with the scholarship limit and, and still being able to add a lot of talent to the roster, you know, year in, year out? I, I think that... I think that early on um, in this, we were helping out walk-ons. 
I think very early on that that was something because of the reputation here and because of the vision that we wanted to have in terms of a broad ranging NIL. I mean, we discussed philosophy, you know, with 1890 in terms of that, that we wanted this to be broad ranging. Um, and so from the very beginning, walk-ons um, were, were, you know, receiving NIL benefits and were benefiting, you know, from their name, image, and likeness regardless of their scholarship. And I, and I do, yeah, I do think it makes it, it makes it easier at times. Uh, it makes you allow to, you know, if somebody's, you know, from here or, you know, you get those bounce back type of guys that, that uh, you might have an opportunity to make it a little bit more affordable. Those are always, you know, those are always, always options. I mean, frankly speaking, even going back to, you know, when I was coaching at Fordham, a lot of times you were hoping on great financial aid packages. You know what I mean? Come on, give me all that grant money. You know what I mean? I don't want loans. Let's, let's, let's have grant money. You know what I mean? Well, now we're in a circumstance. There was always how could you make it better and more beneficial for a walk-on to, to join a program. This just has supercharged it. Sean, you mentioned the, the on-field stuff pointing at the book um, and the way that you manage things, but as a staff, how do you kind of approach putting the book together? Has it changed? Um, and, and how do you kind of self-scout, I guess, the way that you as a staff have handled in-game situations here versus, you know, Baylor or Temple or whatever? Well, you know, frankly, we subscribe to a service. Uh, there's actually two different services that we subscribe to where you know that 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 book is a uh, is a benefit of it, but there's there's a lot more to it in terms of in game. Hey, think about this, think about that. They 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 really spark your brain on a lot of that. Uh, I would say that it hasn't. It's you know as far as Temple, it was a lot more gut uh, in terms of you know coaches' decision making, and I think Baylor as well. I think we really kind of move towards um, at least keeping an eye on that book, but we don't follow it a hundred percent. You know what I mean? Like sometimes they'll say, hey, you should let them score here. And you're like, I don't, I don't know about that. Like, you know, our two minutes not moving all that well right now. That might not make a whole heck of a lot of sense. So there's the book and then there's context. Uh, and I think that, uh, you know, over the years, again, that everything has changed. Two-minute drill now will, will change how this works. Out-of-bounds rules have changed over the years. First-down rules have changed over the years. So you just got to know the conditions. Uh, and, and, and what has changed. And so I think we've, you know, I think Coach still, you know, in the end is pretty much going to go to his gut. Hey, Sean, Kevin Bland from the Omaha World Herald. You were laying out your job description a little bit earlier. At what point in your career did you kind of make that shift that this could be maybe your skill set or your kind of job as opposed to being an on-field coach? And well, it, it, I'm going to tell you guys right now, I still want to be a defensive line coach. Okay, I, I still do, more than anything else. And T-Knight knows that. And everybody that's, that's ever worked under Matt that's been a D-line coach knows that I'm always going to go over to your drills a little bit and just see how they're going. Um, but it, it's, this is new space, you know what I mean? So as, as Coach was interviewing for this job, he and I talked, and, and we talked about some of the, some of the things that, that need to be asked, you know what I mean? And uh, org charts and, you know, what's the condition of this? What's the condition of that? Um, and so <clears throat> I think, I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? I, I just said org charts. Yeah, just when you knew <laughs> that this sort of line of work would be. Oh, oh, so, so we, 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 the, this was the biggest question mark going into it. What was the collective situation? Um, you know, what was the dollar situation? What's the fiscal health of the athletic department, those were all questions that we sort of, you know, talked about. And when he, he offered me, the, he asked me at that time if I wanted to go. And I did not want to, I was living at the beach, what can I tell you? Um, but I was working remotely for a company. I was doing performance and injury um, analytics software, for, you know, working for NFL teams and uh, and. and Premier League teams, this company had a lot of clients, and it was interesting work, and I felt like I understood the performance space a lot more. But, you know, in the end, this was a, a, a whole new space. Uh, I think Coach has a lot of trust in me. I think I have a, a, a business background somewhat, and so I think that sort of kept him at ease in terms of all of these. And, and in the end, I, I feel like I just I filled the gap. No matter what we've done, over the years, no matter what program we've been to, 
um, whenever there's sort of something new, he kind of throws me at it and says, all right, hey, hey, figure this out. And so that was sort of, you know, coming into NIL, it was how do we help, how do we help give this some structure? And so when I came here, I first came here as a consultant. I wasn't going to stay. And I got charmed by the city of Lincoln, uh, by the people here. And I got supercharged uh, by the setup at 1890 and their philosophy to sit there and say that every dollar goes to athletes, like every single external penny that they raise goes to athletes. It doesn't go to wallpaper. It doesn't go to anybody's salary or commission or nothing. I think that that's a, a, an amazing thing. And I think that's something we should be yelling from the rooftop. And so that charged me up as well. And in the end, they just, they then muscled me. Julie Rule started texting me. Sarah Satterfield started texting me. Ed Foley's wife, Becky, started texting me. We need you. You know, then the recruiting got turned on to me. Uh, and, and so I, I, I jumped in because I was excited about the way things were situated here. And I was excited about the challenge. Speaking of the way things are oh, Steve Sipple from Husker Online. The way things are situated, how does that, that training facility affect recruiting how does it affect your overall job that got to be the best football building in the world it no uh, no uh i've i've been in i'm not going to start naming names but but through my years and um we attempted to build a building in carolina that's a whole nother story but we started the process at temple uh of, of you know building a new indoor uh I've, I've sat down with populace and when we were at carolina we looked at everybody uh, Benfico out in Portugal and you know we didn't go to them but we're looking at what everybody has in each of these facilities and uh, and and so when I came when we came here we were like oh do you have you know are you guys gonna put in this oh yeah we have that you're gonna put in that oh yeah we have oh, gonna... so like everything that when when we were first daydreaming in Carolina about everything that we could possibly put in this and how could we make this the most player friendly situation uh, in in the league coming here it was the same architecture firm that, 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 that put this vision into place here, but nearly everything that we talked about uh, and wanted for is here. And so, yeah, and I've been in a lot of other buildings and I've seen a lot of designs of other places, and this is the best football building in the world. How's your office in there? I fought for that field side office and I got it. So I, I'm overlooking the fields uh, and I dig it, but it's great. It's great. It, it's... It's just the space is well thought out, and it's you know it, it has it's functional as well as great by design. Uh, right now, we just need the elevators to work. My knees hurt me a little bit. We take these steps over and over again, but I probably should do it anyway. Is it, is it how important is it you think to players, to especially incoming players? I think that in the end, what you're you end up talking about is you're talking about all the things that you're pouring into athletes, like all the things that, that we're, we're trying to pour into you, we're trying to develop into you. I asked Coach Belichick when he was here, I said, you've had some, famously had some guys come to the Patriots for less or, or stay at the Patriots for less. How do you do that? How do you, how do you make that argument? He says, he goes, you stand by the work you put into that individual. And so whether it's, you know, some people kind of mock all the different staff members we have here, every one of them's pouring into players. Every single one of them on a daily basis are pouring into players, whether it's you know, the red light therapy and the sauna and the cold tubs and the hot tubs and the uh, zero gravity uh, underwater treadmills and all of those things. They're all there to be poured right back into players. And so, so that has to account for you know, the care that's going to go into the individual is that not only this space is a demonstration of the effort that's going to come from the people that are here. And so to be able to point to these and to be able to, you know, not just sit there and say, isn't this great, sit there and say, isn't this great, why don't you talk to Mitch about the things he does from a sports science standpoint. So it's emblematic of the effort that goes into our athletes here. And so it's, I don't think anyone's coming just because of it, um, but, uh, you know, sometimes you like the sizzle with the steak, you know what I mean, those, you know, those come out sizzling hot, you know what I mean? But, but it's emblematic of, of, of the effort that's going into these athletes here. Coming from D3 as a, as a player and getting your start and then up through all the stops that you've been, NFL included, 
when you're in this organization, and as you said, there are so many, so many people with responsibilities that probably have crossover. What are the challenges that exist within within this place to make sure that you're efficient? You want to communicate. Uh, you, you want to have over communication. I mean, we have different lines of communication, different working groups uh, that are involved. Um, you know, we have an executive team meeting or executive staff meeting, you know, every Tuesday at 2 o'clock. Um, we all work off of the same document. I mean, I could go for days and days on how we get organized. I mean, that's, you know, Microsoft Teams is very big for our personnel department uh, and our operations department. It's where they share. It's where they cross over. So, like, a, you know, you have an official visit weekend. Operations and recruiting personnel need to be one. You know, everybody's head count. You know, when we go on the road, we all work for operations. When we have a recruiting weekend, everybody works for personnel. So everybody is all hands. Nobody's sitting in their office door closed. Everybody is up and out on hand. So you want to communicate, you want to over communicate. You know, we have communication chains going on all over the place. Um, but uh, that's, that's how we try and keep ourselves organized. Sean, I had a recruiting calendar question. So is the, the signing in December, has it moved up officially two weeks this year? Have they done that yet? I don't know. Don't, okay. I yeah. don't know if they officially have done that. But with the in-home visits and, and whatnot, it, I mean, are you guys almost trying to simulate those in the spring the way you're able to now have coaches talk to juniors at schools and have their parents there? Uh, we've seen some pictures, obviously, where you have maybe 10 coaches go to a school now. And how different has that been? managing uh, the new recruiting calendar rules? Uh, I think that it's been, uh, honestly, Vince is the one that will, will ta tackles a lot of those. Um, I wouldn't say we're trying to replicate anything, you know, in terms of December, in terms of anticipating uh, anything changing. The whole dang thing shifted dramatically while we were away, while we were in Carolina or while Coach was away. So when we came back, they just started to have those spring visits but we were at Baylor, and we were like, well, no, the December visits are great. You know, if you're at a place where it's cold in December, yeah, you want to jump on those June visits. So we came here, and we were jumping on the June visits, and, and sort of that's now the whole thing has shifted to that. I don't, I don't know where it's going to go. I honestly don't. Uh, there's valid points to everybody's, you know, let's, let's have a signing. Let's have an early one in June, at the end of June, or let's have an earlier one. You know, everybody has valid points to it. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll put together a vote as a, you know, as a, as a staff here in terms of all the different things. But Would you like a summer signing day yourself, personally, just to kind of get those guys signed, whether it's like late June or the first? <sighs> I don't want to go cross with the THSCA. The Texas High School Coaches Association is vehemently against it. <laughs> um, and a, as I'm sure some other high school organizations are as well. Um, I'm going to hold my answer. I don't really know. I, I, I don't think, you, oh, I always am concerned about the cascade of decisions. Like, so you make a decision, and how does that cascade out? And how does that affect things down the line? And they bring up a valid point in terms of that. Uh, if they can officially sign and be signed, will they play that game? Will they, will, will, will they, will they opt out? I think it's a valid concern. Um, and I think it has to be studied a little bit more. I'm, I'm, I don't know the answer. I don't think that we've, we're guessing what the cascade effect would be. You know what I mean? And I think we've got to make sure that we move. We're, we're changing a lot of things right now. You know what I mean? So I don't know. I don't really have it. That's my, that's my non-answer answer. How was that for my first non-answer? Nope. You have a, uh, a system at rule story. I mean, you, you guys go way back. When, like, at what point when you guys were together did you kind of think, you know, this guy... Uh, so I worked, um, I got out of football and I was, I was out of football for a little while. And then I was coaching little kids, five and six year olds. Uh, I was coaching the West Philly Tar Heels. Uh, it was so much fun. Uh, it was inner city, Philadelphia, um, Papa playground, um, and over by Cobbs Creek Parkway. You guys don't know that, but anyway, I was coaching there and we have a banquet. So it's, you know, it's, it's youth football. And it's all parents that are there for the right reasons. It was kind of a really cool thing. You know, I went from coaching kids, you know, one kid that went to the NFL, and then the next I'm coaching five- and six-year-olds. But it was really fun. And we needed a speaker for our banquet, which was just, you know, it was just uh, fish fry in a, in a grade school gym. And so I asked Matt, who was coaching at Temple, if he would come in and, and, and talk to the room. And he burned the room to the ground. 
I couldn't believe it. He just went, he was just my friend, you know, he was a good football coach. And he got up there and he took control of the room like I've never seen. And I, I just, my jaw dropped. I couldn't believe it. And I texted our mutual friend, Jeff Collins. I'm like, rule just burn this room to the ground. I can't believe it. And he just wrote back, yeah, your boy can talk. Uh, and so that was, that was kind of, that was a, a, a thing. Like I knew he was a good young coach, a good friend. Uh, but I, I didn't know he could command a room like that. And it was really, that was when really when my eyes, I was like, oh, boy, wow. So. We, see, we see Matt Rule here in front. No, go ahead. We see Matt Rule here in press conference settings. What's he like behind closed doors? The same dude. The same dude. Yeah, there's no, there's no difference to it. He's, he's the same dude. Anything else for Sean? Cool.